Uh, so the first thing that's in this, in your notes about taxonomy, is why we would even use taxonomy. Uh, so what I have here is a few specific examples to illustrate why it's a good idea to classify organisms, because it provides us with some useful information. The first reason, if I had to give it a name, would be predictive value. By predictive value, I mean this generic statement that's at the top. If I have classified organisms into a group, and I find that some of the organisms in a group have a characteristic, and by characteristic, I usually mean something that is useful or advantageous. Uh, and then I'll give you an example of what that might be. Then another species that is in this same group should probably have this same characteristic. So my example here is about plants that are related. If two plants are related, and by related I mean they share some level of taxonomy. Now, genus is one of the levels that is close to the most specific. Species would be the most specific. But two organisms that have the same genus would be very closely related. And I'm just going to make a little note here, uh, because I'll come back to this point of how closely related things are. But if two plants are in the same genus, and I discover that one of these plants is a source of some food that we like, or a drug, and by drug I mean medicine here, not recreational, uh, then it might be very advantageous for us to know what other organisms belong to that same group. Because there's a very reasonable chance that if one plant in a group has it, the other plants will as well, because they're related. So, this is a substance, it's called taxol. Uh, so this would be the medicine that we're discussing in this example. You can make it from the bark of a Pacific yew, which is this tree. Its scientific, na scientific name is Taxus brevifolia. Taxus then is its genus. Brevifolia is its species. Uh, this substance is very useful in the treatment of breast cancer, so it would be advantageous if I could find other organisms that also produced taxol. Now, one of the reasons that would be helpful is that I need three trees worth of bark to treat just one person. So if I could find other trees that were related to this specific U, then hopefully taxol would occur in the other species. So from a very practical perspective, it's easier to find this medicine because now we've grouped organisms and we know that everything in this category could help contribute to the source of taxol that we're going to use. Now, would I expect you to memorize this specific example? No, this is just to illustrate how we could predict a useful characteristic based on classification. Now, there are two other reasons that we would classify organisms. One of them is species identification. Now, let's say that you are out and about, and you find an organism, and you would like to know what it is. If you have already classified organisms based on shared characteristics, which is what you're going to do in your assignment, then it will be easier to figure out where it belongs. So if things are already classified, it's easier to fit new things into the classification. Uh, so my example on the side there is about sea snails. Uh, my parents regularly go on tropical vacations without me. They take my sister, not me. Uh, no, makes me angry. <laughs> uh, but one of the things I remember hearing about was there's a place where you could go and you could basically like find your own seafood. They had like an area where you collect it and then they would prepare the seafood for you. Uh, but we were looking for sea snails that were edible versus sea snails that weren't. And this was the classification catalog. Uh, there were pictures that showed what it looked like if it was edible and what it looked like if it was not. Since we already had this classification, it was easy to tell, hmm, this sea snail that I picked up, is it one of the edible ones? Oh, it is, because it shares characteristics. Or, oh, it's not, because it shares characteristics with these other ones. So identifying a new species is much easier if we've already made a classification scheme. 
The last one, evolutionary links, I'm just going to put a little note here. We will talk about evolution in grand detail in chapter four. That'll be what we do after the Christmas break is chapter four. Uh, and one of the things that we have come to realize is that if organisms are in the same group, it's probably because they share characteristics, and that is probably because they come from a common ancestor. That little phrase, common ancestor, is one that we'll use repeatedly when we talk about evolution, because that's one of the main ideas that we'll focus on. So if two organisms appear to have the same characteristics, I can then infer, well, they must have had a common ancestor. Maybe they evolved sort of the same way. So I have two examples down here. This picture goes with A. This picture kind of goes with B. In A, there are pictures of two different Hawaiian plants uh, that are actually both silver swords. But if you look at them, one of them is like tall and green, one of them is short and silvery colored. They don't actually look very similar. But if we were to compare them on a bunch of other characteristics, they share a lot of characteristics, just their appearance isn't one of them. The fact that they are in the same group but they look different helps us understand this idea of adaptation. One of them adapted to one type of environment, the other adapted to another type of environment. Uh, a very similar example that maybe you would have heard of before, uh, if you've ever heard of people talk about Charles Darwin and how he studied birds on the Galapagos Islands, and they all have different kinds of beaks. They're all finches, but their beak is a different shape depending on what their food source is. So having things grouped, uh, helps us understand maybe how they evolved or what environmental conditions might have caused that. My other example is about a tree, so a southern beech is a tree. Uh, its scientific uh, group name is Notophagus. They are found in New Zealand, but also in South America. Now that's weird because New Zealand and South America are very <laughs> far apart. This is South America, and New Zealand is like way over here. Uh, but the picture is trying to illustrate uh, where maybe there might have been connections between the continents in the past. So finding species that are the same in different places would help us understand this idea of biogeography how biology helps us understand maybe how geography has changed. You might have heard in the past uh, that our belief, and by our I mean scientists in general, is that the continents of our planet used to all be attached to each other. And this would be a piece of evidence that could support that argument, because how else would a tree have gotten from New Zealand to South America or vice versa? So these three reasons, are reasons that we would want to classify organisms. So I gave you different examples for each of them. Like I said, if I asked you a question about this, I would probably ask it in a way that you could give whatever answer you wanted to give. These are only representative examples. You wouldn't have to use those as examples. You could talk about any species that you know about. Uh, but those three reasons, predicting things, Identifying new species and explaining evolution, those would be the main ideas for why we would classify organisms. Now, we looked at this slide yesterday, but I'll just go over it briefly again. Our main idea here is that organisms get grouped based on shared characteristics. So when you're doing your assignment, you need to look at the organisms and ask yourself, who do they share characteristics with? If they share characteristics, they should probably be in a group together. Now this is the beginning of taxonomy for real life. This is how organisms are distributed. These are all of the taxonomic levels that are used. We said that species is very specific, whereas life down here is very broad. So every time we change levels, we get more and more specific in terms of what characteristics we are discussing. Now in your assignment, I told you that you have to use genus and species, and you have to use kingdom and phylum, but that you could get rid of the other levels because you only have 14 organisms. 
One thing I do want to mention, because a few people asked me this, if the way you're classifying things, if it would be easier for you to add one of those levels back in, just so that you can classify things nicely, feel free to do that. I'm not saying that you can't use those levels, just that you don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, so the next slide uh, just tells you a little bit about how you give something its scientific name. The term that we use is binomial nomenclature. Bi means two, nomial means name. So binomial nomenclature means identifying an organism with two names. Now it's called binomial nomenclature, but you'll see uh, at the bottom, one of my examples has actually more than two. And that's because it's changing all the time. This is sort of how the system was developed. But every time we find a new organism, we have to maybe add or change things about how we're classifying organisms. When we use binomial nomenclature, here are the rules. The first name is the genus, and you put a capital letter with it. So if I talk about humans, Anyone know our scientific name? Yes, Homo sapiens. So in this, Homo is our genus. The second name is the species name, and it has a lowercase first letter. So in Homo sapiens, this would be our species. Now, if you are printing with a printer or some sort of electronic device, you can use italics. And so you'll see that's what I did in the notes because I was typing things. If you are writing it by hand, we would normally underline it just because it's weird to write in italics when you're writing by hand. Uh, so you need to do something, either put it in italics or underline it to indicate that this is a proper scientific name. Uh, you will always put a capital on the first thing, no matter where it shows up in whatever sentence you are writing. And you would never put a capital on the second one. That way, we know that they go together. If you put a capital letter on the second one, it seems like you're starting a new name. Now, does anyone want to ask any questions about the rules for binomial nomenclature? Uh, you would italicize the whole thing if you were typing it. Uh, but if you're writing it by hand, you can just underline it. So if you were typing it, it would be like, I'm trying to write crooked here. You would write the whole thing in italics. Uh, but since a lot of the time you'll be just writing it out with your hand, you can just underline it and that would be appropriate. So on the page, I have three pictures of organisms because I wanted to give you some idea about how we come up with the binomial name. Uh, I mentioned yesterday the idea of location. That's the scientific name of an alligator, and obviously alligator mississippiensis is named for where it is near the Mississippi River. Uh, so location could be a way that an organism gets its scientific name. The one in the middle, you'll notice, has three names. If you see a third name, we are usually talking about some sort of subspecies. You could liken it to uh, another race of something. So for example, Panthera tigris altaica is specifying that this is a Siberian tiger, not just a regular tiger. Uh, so Panthera tigris, this is the binomial name that we started with. But more recently, third words have been added to some species names to make them more specific. I'm not expecting you to use a third name, but if you were ever to look up species names and you see a third one, that's what it's for. Uh, the last one over here is to show you that sometimes an organism gets its name simply from its appearance. So this is a cute little koala. Its scientific name is Phascolarctos cenarius. If you take the word, what does it actually mean? The first part means pouch, arctos means bear, and cenarius means ash colored. So its scientific name literally is gray bear with a pouch. So you can take its appearance and make the scientific name out of that. 
So when you are making scientific names for your assignment, these are some suggestions if you're stuck coming up with scientific names for what you can use. Now, does anyone want to ask any questions about binomial nomenclature? Yes. So if we were like doing that, where would we find the certain word? Ah, so a lot of these things come from Latin or from Greek. So when I suggested to you maybe use a different language, it doesn't have to be Latin or Greek. It can be some other language. Some people are using German or uh, one group, you guys are using Esperanto, so it's like a made-up language that people made. Uh, I know people have used Zulu before. A number of people have used French or Spanish before. Uh, so what I'm asking you to do is don't just put an English word. Make it sound science-y. Uh, you can use an English word and just change the ending of it, and that can make it sound like a Latinized word. So you can be creative with it. Uh, but don't just write gray bear. Give it some sort of science-sounding name uh, by being fancy and using another language. Uh, I think the other thing I'll mention then here is the idea of genus. If two organisms are really closely related, their genus should be the same. So in your assignment, maybe I might suggest, uh, look at organisms that seem really similar. For example, there are three humanoids that are part of your assignment. It would make sense if they all had the same genus name because they're all humanoids. I'm not saying you have to do that, but I'm saying it would make sense for two organisms that are very similar to have the same genus name, but a different species name. Does anyone want to ask anything else right now? Okay. So this page is to give you just an example of what kind of things we would use at each of the levels of taxonomy. So there are always subdivisions. The last two are always genus and species. The levels that you classify an organism with are these. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. This little sentence here is the mnemonic that I learned at some point in my life uh, to help me remember what order things go in. Uh, when I learned this originally, there was no D at the beginning because we never used to use domain. It just started with kingdom. Uh, but the D uh, in Danish represents domain. The K in king represents kingdom. The P or the P and the H in Philip represents phylum. Uh, came for class, over for order, four for family, green for genus, S for species. And I'm showing you that probably more for the future than for now because there's not a point where I will be like, hey, tell me all the levels of classification in order. That's not the type of thing that I would ask, but those are the levels and that's how you can remember how they go. We already know what a species is, so we're just reminding you that that's the definition of species. So on the left, I have my example here of a leopard. And just to give you an idea of the types of characteristics that we could use to classify organisms, I'm showing you the leopard's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So the first kingdom is the animal kingdom. Notice that the word is animalia. So it's the word animal, but we've added something to the ending to make it sound scientific. The phylum here is cord data. Uh, this is referring to things that have a spinal cord. So anything that has a spinal cord would be in that category. The next one is mammalia. So we're talking about mammals, things that give birth to live young and have fur. Then the next level is carnivora. So you might want to think about what trophic level an organism is at, and that could be one of your subdivisions in your assignment. Then for family, we have Felidae, that's the cat family. So all cats go in this family. House cats, big cats, little cats, mountain cats, they all go there. Panthera, this is the big cat family. Uh, anything that's a large cat, like a lion, a tiger, a panther, a leopard, they all go in this same genus. 
And then the species is where we specify exactly which one of the big cats is it. Uh, so Panthera pardus, pardus means spotted. So we're getting the name from its appearance. Uh, so that's another example of that. Uh, a jaguar is called a Panthera anca because anca means black. Uh, a lion is Panthera leo. Leo always refers to lion if you think about maybe zodiac signs. But those are just some examples of how we would classify organisms. So this is to give you an idea of what type of characteristics you could use to separate the organisms in your assignment. Obviously, you don't have to use all of these, but just so you have an idea. Uh, I would never ask you to memorize all of these words. I just wanted to give you an example of the type of characteristic we would use for classification. Uh, now, over on the right, I just wanted to uh, maybe emphasize a little bit more the idea of a common ancestor. This is showing how all of the things that are alive could sort of be arranged. And down here at the bottom, the idea is that there was a common ancestor and from that common ancestor came all of the different types of organisms that exist. So there are three main branches. Each of them is for one of the three domains. We are generally working in this domain made of eukaryotic organisms. So all of the organisms that are in your assignment are kind of on that side of things uh, because I only picked animals and plants, really. But what I want you to recognize is that there has to be something common at some point. So all organisms, even if they're not closely related, share some level of taxonomy with each other, even if it's just that they are all living. So if we go to the next one, there's a little example to, so that I can illustrate things that are closely related and things that are not closely related. In the example, I start off with just humans and great white sharks. And I want you to notice that the first two levels are common, but that these last levels are not common. So are humans and great white sharks related? Yes, they are. They are both in the kingdom uh, of animals and they are both in the kingdom chordata. But after that, they are in different categories. If I were to take and add right here a chimp, a chimpanzee, and I were to ask myself, which levels does it have in common with a human? It would have kingdom, phylum, class, and order all in common with the human. The level where it starts to be different is the family level. Now if I compare these, what I could say then is the chimp is more closely related to humans. And that is the kind of thing that I would ask you uh, about taxonomic levels. So I'm going to pause here, and we're going to look at something in your textbook. All right, uh, we have one last slide to look at, uh, and then you will have some time to work on things. Uh, the last thing that's part of the assignment that you're going to do is a dichotomous key. A dichotomous key is a classification tool. So we're still talking about classifying organisms. This is a series of numbered statements. So down here, I have some numbered statements. That is how a traditional dichotomous key looks. Now, for most people, it's kind of hard to start with the traditional dichotomous key. So what I like to suggest is that you do a little bit of planning before you make your dichotomous key. And chances are this planning will be very similar to what you were doing to try to classify organisms in kingdoms and phylums, uh, like question number one of the assignment asks you to do. The key thing is that each 
statement has a pair. A pair means two, not four, not seven, not three, it means two. So it has two alternative characteristics. Some alternatives would lead to the next set of statements, and others would actually tell you the name of the organism or the object. So we're going to do a little example uh, using five miscellaneous objects that can be found on my desk. They are a highlighter, a pen, a pencil, a paper clip, and a tiny little pencil sharpener. If I was going to make a dichotomous key out of those five things, the first thing I need to ask myself is, what kind of characteristics do any of these things have in common? And I notice that three of them basically have the same shape. So the first thing, the first characteristic that I'm going to use in question number one is what does it look like? Is it a long tubular object or is it short and non-tubular? Notice that I used non. It is very common in a dichotomous key to say one characteristic and to have the other choice be not the first one. So instead of saying uh, short and sort of squarest shaped, which would have described the pencil sharpener, I simply said it's not tubular. That way, the pencil sharpener and the paper clip, which are not the same shape, actually both fall into that category. So it's, very, it's a very good idea when you make a dichotomous key uh, for the first part of the statement to be the organism has this and the second part to be it doesn't have this. That way there's no room for gray area. Now this distinction turned into question one of my dichotomous key. In question one, choice A was long tubular objects, choice B was short non-tubular objects. Depending on how I answered the question, I would go to another question in my list. So after I divided them into long and tubular, or short and not tubular, I had to do some more distinguishing. Question two comes from this part. Of everything that was long and tubular, I asked myself, what are they made out of? Some of them are made from plastic, some of them are made from something other than plastic. So see, I didn't say what they were made out of, I just said that it wasn't plastic. In my dichotomous key, there is question two, constructed from plastic or constructed from something other than plastic. Now, if it was made out of something other than plastic, there was only one choice, the pencil. So in my dichotomous key, instead of telling me which question to go to next, I simply say it was the pencil. That's it. That's the end of the line for that particular set of questions. If it was constructed from plastic, because there were two things that were made out of plastic, I go to question three. And question three was about color. Is it blue and gray or blue or is it green and gray? And there's question three in my dichotomous key. If it was green and gray, it was the highlighter. If it was blue and clear, it was the pen. Now I have a fourth question down here because I still need to classify the objects that were short and non-tubular. So way up here in 1B it said if it was short and non-tubular, go to question four. So there's, there I am. If it was black and silver, it was the pencil sharpener. If it was just silver, it was the paper clip. So what is on the top is not different necessarily than what is on the bottom. It's just that what is on the bottom is the traditional dichotomous key format. And that is what I would like for you to submit as part of your assignment. Now, there are two places in your textbooks that, that we will look so that I can show you an example of dichotomous keys for organisms and show you an example of how you might start making one. So if you could please find...